there's a system known as ELF, extra low frequency. Uh, it's also a massive antenna that's embedded in the ice there. When I arrived to the facility as a tradesman and firefighter, I was um, read into how everything worked because I needed for the safety of my crew to be able to battle fires and, and engage things appropriately. And at the onset, I was told that the ELF system is off. It's defunct, it's disabled, it is just sitting dead in the ice. But through my uh, need to make an additional repair on something else and tracing back to a sub panel, I was finding the circuit that I needed to lock out, tag out, and do all the safe repairs. But then I noticed that this other breaker that was supposed to be off was in the on position and it was listed as the ELF. And I ran it up my chain. I said, what's going on here? I said, this is supposed to be off. I was told it's off now. And I was just given a hard, it's on. And that was the end of my need to know. They didn't want to tell me anything else. You, you have identified the circuit that you need to work on. You have been informed that you can safely do your job. Carry on. So I did my job. I made the repair that I needed to on the circuit next to the circuit that I was now informed is duly on and operating. So the ELF is up and running. And that, again, is a multifaceted directed energy weapons platform. Do you have pictures of any of this stuff? I have a lot of pictures of me in these facilities. Um, they mostly just prove my presence. Can, if you hand those over, I'll display them on screen right now, if I can get them. I can get you pictures before you present this to the world. I would appreciate that. Let's talk about the clear air system called Aero. Yes. Commonly referred to as the no-fly zone. Yes. The ARO building, A-R-O, is the Atmospheric Research Observatory. It is listed on the chart, the one that I gave you as well, um, as a no-fly zone in the vaguest sense of the term at first glance. But as any pilot knows, there's always, you know, fine print. So the no-fly zone, as listed at the South Pole Station because of ARO, simply provides a limit to the ability for a plane to fly too low. It sets the floor at 8,000 feet. You can't fly below 8,000 feet. A lot of people like to try to claim that there's a hole at South Pole Station and there's a no-fly zone that protects from you flying in an area that'll see the hole. And that's just total shenanigans. The no-fly zone limits your ability to fly low, not high. So with that height available, you will see everything available to see, which is ice as far as the eye can see. There is no hole in the ice at the South Pole Station. There may be one somewhere else. I can't testify to the entirety of the continent. It's huge. All I can say is that when people are talking about there being a hole at the South Pole, they're full of crap. They don't know what they're talking about. They're taking something that they know very little about and just running with it. They, they say in other ways that, you know, a little information is a dangerous thing, and that's what pe these people are doing, is they're operating off of very little information. The Atmospheric Research Observatory, as I testified uh, in DC, I witnessed myself in doing my standard rounds in the winter season at South Pole Station, that that building would, with great regularity, have a very powerful green laser beam shooting out of it into the cosmos. I believe through other things that I've located there, which is the, um, the chilled helium in a massive amount, it is chilled down to four degrees Kelvin in storage, which my understanding, this is something new that I'm learning about, it's called superfluids. Superfluids act very differently than other things in our scientific spectrum and are used for things called chemical lasers. Well, we had a superfluid and we had a laser. So I believe that what I'm learning on this is that it was probably a secondary means of long-range communication and or another weapons platform. June 18th was my birthday, right after Dr. Greer's event of June 12th. On June 18th, the National Science Foundation website could have posted anything they wanted for a photograph. But on my birthday, I would say I got a gift from someone in the program because they posted a picture of the Arrow Building's green laser blasting into the cosmos. 
which verifies exactly what I saw. Interesting. And you think that might be a communication device? How would they be communicating with the laser? I, I don't understand the science of it. I just know that it exists. Okay. The laser, laser beam communication, direct line of sight, laser beam comms, microwave type comms, it exists. You say a lot of the crew members from the South Pole are experiencing Havana syndrome symptoms. What are some of those symptoms? Uh, they have mental degradation, troubles with their memory, fatigue, stuff like that, skin issues. Headaches? Yes. The Antarctica Treaty of 1959, an agreement signed by 12 nations in which Antarctica, the Antarctic continent was made demilitarized to be preserved for scientific research. What do you think about that? I think it's a load of malarkey. And I'm going to throw a gentleman's name out there that I have worked with. He told me very specifically at the time that we communicated. He's going to die when he sees this video. I worked with a gentleman by the name of Aaron Bontrager. And he was also previously contracted by Raytheon Polar Services as a cook to work on a cat train that went across the ice. And he said the express purpose for him, I should say, for that team working for Raytheon was they were searching for missile site locations. No kidding. Correct. The whole idea of this being demilitarized is a load of baloney. How do you think they're getting, how, do, how are they powering this facility? I believe there's a secondary power source inside of the old pole that was built in 1957. What there, do you mean the old pole? The original pole, I should say, built in 1957, we referred to as old pole. Um, <clears throat> there was um, other facilities that were manufactured, different stages of inhabitation of crew. So 1957 was the first one. It predates the Antarctic Treaty, which means that they could have had nuclear power there. I believe they did have nuclear power there and that since then they may have maintained it almost like a grandfather clause, or that they may have new, more exotic systems that are not in the legalese of the treaty. Why do you think Antarctica is a no-fly zone? Antarctica is not a no-fly zone. Well, uh, Arrow, commonly referred to as a no-fly zone, why? It's, it's a misnomer. You can fly right over the no-fly zone, you just have to be higher than 8,000 feet. Well, I'm asking, why do you have to be higher than 8,000? Oh, feet? because it's because of the uh, they're doing science on the uh, the cleanliness of the air, so they just don't want it tainted. Similarly, there's no land traffic allowed in that area, so you can take a snow machine. If I wanted to go visit the building to do my rounds, I could take a snow machine up to a certain point, and then I had to stop the snow machine and walk because simply the exhaust gases from the machine would taint their sensors. So also the only reason they're trying to block out vehicular activity is to keep the exhaust gases out of their sensors. How do you get there? How do you get to Arrow? Yeah. It's within walking distance of the elevated station. How do you, how do you fly into Antarctica? Uh, you fly in with a, a Herc, LC-130, Her, Herc on skis, and you just come in from outside of that quadrant okay. or, or, or above 8,000 feet. Okay. How, how much air traffic is going around there? Uh, during the summer seasons, 24 hours of operation, they typically have a, hu a few Hercs on deck idling um, most of the time. And a lot of, uh, a lot of fuel is brought in by Herc. Uh, our waste is brought out by Herc when the airmen will allow themselves to be a flying garbage can, as they claim. But um, yeah, basically almost, almost all operations and logistics were done by Herc while we were there. In my 2010 season, they had brought in their first fuel haul over land as kind of an experiment to the process. And it's my understanding that they call this a traverse, that they have since increased traverse activity to drag large fuel bladders across the ice to resupply the fuel that way, being more economic than doing it by Herc and then affording that um, volume of Herc space that's not being utilized for fuel now can, of course, do other things. The, the flight operations are almost 24 hours a day during the summer season because nothing moves in the winter season. So everything has to occur in a certain window. Okay. 
Man, back to the putting voices in people's heads. Um, are you aware of any ways to defend against that? Know thyself. It's an ancient practice and it's an ancient practice for a reason. These modern technologies are bastardizations of ancient techniques. Way back in the day, they would call someone a magician who was adept at this skill. I could walk into the room and I would potentially have that skill set to put my thought in your head. It's just a technique. It's completely doable. But now we have people that are no longer going through these schools of nobility to learn to practice these things nicely. And we have evil people that are taking technologies and utilizing them. Because again, it's just simply electromagnetic impulses. They can be read, they can be used, they can be hijacked. Eric, is there anything that I'm missing that you want to bring to the public? Hmm, that's a great question. I want to emphasize that we are currently in a state of war that people aren't realizing. What is that? These weapons are being wielded around us, against us. Uh, there are power players that are uh, above nation states. Geographical boundaries and political parties mean very little to the wealthy elite on this planet. We're, we're pawns, we're chattel. Um, I am uh, a person for the people. We, the people of this planet, deserve a better future than the one we are being presented. We've, we've all, through our blood, sweat, and tears, we've invested here in the United States. We've invested our taxpayer dollars for these people to create weapon systems that they're using against us. This is, it's a sin. It's illegal, it's a sin, it's immoral, and we have to do better for the future generations of this planet. Are you worried for your safety? No. Why not? I'm, I'm just simply beyond that. I don't, um, I don't really care what happens to me. I care about doing the right thing. Do you think you're in danger? I guess theoretically people don't like me doing what I'm doing. Yeah, I would say probably not. Fair enough. But um, work, if, if that's it, that's a lot of info in a short amount of time, and I really appreciate you coming here mm -hmm. and, um, and inform us all. Mm -hmm. So have you been approached by any media outlets? I've been approached by a lot of people. Really? And I pretty much tell them to go scratch. Why do you tell them that? Because I can tell from the way that they approach me, they're not looking to do justice by what I'm saying. Um, they're what I refer to as dissipators, people that are looking to waste my energy, divert it into the wrong direction. Uh, I'm very fortunate, and I would say blessed, to have met someone like yourself who seems to be on the up and up and going um, to fight the good fight on this stuff to get to the actual brass tax truth and present it to the world in an untainted capacity. There's, there's a lot of bad things going on on this planet. I'm sure that you've experienced it yourself firsthand, and you're aware that a lot of people don't know that these things are happening in the shadows. I want people to know what's really going on on this planet so they can make educated decisions about what they have to do uh, to protect themselves and their children. Well, that's very noble of you. You want me?